I've been receiving so many questions about the COVID-19 saga each and every day from patients, family, friends, viewers. There's so much anxiety and panic around this topic that I decided to create a video to simply say what I would want as a physician for my own patient and peeps to know. I'm gonna review the three most vital pieces of information that you need to know when it comes to this outbreak. Here it goes. If it's your first time here, I'm Dr. Madge. Consider subscribing to this channel for up-to-date medical topics, news, and headlines. First of all, today's date is March 10th, 2020. Things can change rapidly through time, so it's vital to know the timing and the surrounding context of what I'm reviewing today because it may change tomorrow. So if there are three things that I'd want you to know about the COVID-19 virus, this is what it would be. Number one, try not to obsess over numbers. Numbers reported in the media can sometimes be a little misleading. So the World Health Organization recently reported a CFR, which is a case fatality rate, a term that you may have been hearing a buzz about, which is a fraction of the deaths among confirmed cases. Now, this seems to be the number one number that the media is fixated on, so let's talk about it. Note that most data that we have on this virus right now are based on how it behaved in China. It could vary significantly once we have more data from outside China and the United States. For COVID-19, the World Health Organization just reported a CFR of 3.4% derived from calculating approximately 3,100 deaths over 90,000 confirmed cases globally, which equals 3.4. Sounds pretty terrifying and it's higher than what we previously thought based on China's report of an overall 2.3% CFR. Now compare this to the flu's 0.1% CFR. It's easy to interpret this as evidence that the COVID-19 is really worse than what we even thought. The truth is the CFR can be misleading and appear worse in the early days of any new virus. And the COVID-19 is definitely in its infancy since its birth in December of 2019. Because we don't know the denominator yet, meaning the number of people who really have been infected. We haven't tested enough people in this country, meaning the US. And since most illnesses are mild, we may never catch these people who weren't sick enough to come in to be seen at the doctor's office, urgent care, or the emergency room. The more mild cases that we test, the smaller this CFR rate will become. Note that as of early March, South Korea has been testing more than 10,000 people a day, confirmed about 6,000 cases and 35 total deaths. That yields a 0.5% death rate. Kudos to South Korea because with more people being tested across all illnesses ranging from mild to severe, the CFR reflects more accurate information. Now, as of today in the US, there have been 25 deaths out of 657 cases, yielding a 3.8% fatality rate. Now, it's not because for some reason the virus is just more fatal in the US, but it's because we barely just started testing in this country. Heck, we don't even have enough testing kits. I can't believe it. Hence, missing infected people with mild cases and creating a falsely elevated CFR. Note that the fatality rate will also vary by age. Most deaths have been in those age 60 or higher, increasing with each decade significantly, with children being the lowest risk. With that being said, the CDC just released an advisory statement this past week. I'll place a link in the description below. Encouraging people over the age of 60 and those with underlying medical conditions of any age to plan and stay home as much as possible and avoid crowded places, non-essential air travel, and cruise travel. The fatality rate would also vary depending on your health status. Specific condition studies so far have revealed a fatality rate for cardiovascular disease to be 10.5%, diabetes to be 7%, chronic lung disease, hypertension, and cancer to be all 6% each. Those without an underlying medical condition, 0.9%. There will also be regional and country variations. Countries with more advanced healthcare systems that are better equipped to handle greater patient loads and quality supportive care may have lower fatality rates. So remember, numbers reported in the media can sometimes be a tad misleading. Number two, 
There seems to be a lot of confusion around the differences and similarities between the COVID-19 flu and cold viruses, so let's compare and contrast them right now. Let's first review the variations and similarities of the symptoms. Nasal symptoms, such as runny and stuffy nose, are one of the most prominent features of the cold, where they are mild or non-existent with the flu and COVID-19. So if you have a lot of nasal symptoms, chances are that you have a cold. Whereas with the flu and COVID-19, the most prominent features are the fever, cough, fatigue, and body aches. Although most people with a cold do develop a cough as well, fever and significant fatigue and body aches are uncommon. Transmission for all three are via air droplets and touch, but they differ in the onset or how they begin. With the cold, it's gradual. The typical progress includes an initial sore throat, then nasal symptoms, and then a cough. Whereas with the flu and the COVID-19, it's very sudden. One day you feel fine and the next you feel like you got hit by a truck. Now all three can last up to two weeks, but with the COVID-19, the severe pneumonia cases have been reported to last up to six weeks. The common cold is often mild, but highly annoying but the flu and COVID-19 can range between mild and severe. Death with a common cold is unlikely to happen, but with the flu, the rate has been reported as 0.1%, like I mentioned, and with COVID-19, it's so far reported as 3.4%, but that is changing by the minute. Treatment for all three is supportive, meaning there's no cure, but you can simply treat the symptoms with over-the-counter medications, IV fluids, oxygen if necessary, etc. And the only one with a vaccine available today is the flu. A few extra pointers. COVID-19 doesn't seem to transmit as efficiently as the flu, according to the World Health Organization. One of the main ways the flu spreads is via those carrying the virus who don't have any symptoms or don't have symptoms yet. Although possible, this is not the main way that the COVID-19 seems to spread. Only 1% of COVID-19 cases don't report symptoms and most of those people end up developing symptoms within a couple of days. Because of this, according to the World Health Organization, although containment may not be possible for the flu, it is possible for the COVID-19. So we must have plans and protocols in place to contain this thing. Also, COVID-19 may be causing a higher number of severe illnesses than the flu because it's still a novel virus no pun intended, that people have not been exposed to before. People haven't had the chance to build up any immunity to it. This means that more people are susceptible and initially will see more severe cases popping up. In addition, there are no available antiviral medications to shorten the duration and the severity of it like there is with the flu. There's no vaccine like there is for the flu. Although, please tell me why 50% of you are not getting it. Why? Whereas the flu has been around for many years, we know what it does and how it behaves. The COVID-19 is rather unchartered territory. And lastly, what do you do if you get sick? Here's what I'd advise most of my patients to do and what I'd want them to know. Note that most infections are not severe. According to studies done in China, most cases are mild. Out of 100 infected people, China reports that 81 cases will be mild, 14 will be severe, including shortness of breath, uh, diminished oxygenation, or over 50% of lung involvement seen on imaging within 48 hours, meaning more severe pneumonia. And five will be critical, meaning respiratory failure, shock, organ failure, and about two to three people out of this five may actually die. So first of all, if you're sick, don't panic because that doesn't help in any situation. But at the same time, please take it very seriously because although you may have a mild case, your elderly grandparent or your coworker on chemo may not be so lucky. Do everything you possibly can to contain the virus and not contribute to its spread if you get sick. That includes self-isolation and staying home if you are sick. I cannot stress that enough. I was absolutely floored to see one of the school districts send out an email that encourages parents to take their kids and themselves to the doctor to just get tested if they're sick, not even specifying what sick actually really means. No, 
The last thing you want to do is waltz into a medical facility at the first sign of a sniffle or sore throat and spread these nasty viruses to other patients in the waiting room. Many are frail seniors and are people with underlying medical conditions and the last thing that they need is to get plagued with the flu or the COVID-19. So most COVID-19 flu and cold cases are mild, like I mentioned, and the safest place for these people is the home for mild cases. For anyone with confirmed or suspected COVID-19, the CDC recommends that you stay home until you're free of a fever, defined as 100.4 degrees or higher, signs of a fever, and any other respiratory symptom, meaning cough mostly, for at least 24 hours. This is without using fever reducers or medications, by the way. But for everyone else sick with a fever and or cough who are wondering if you should come in or not, or if you should get tested or not, please call your doctor first. They will triage your symptoms and then determine if, when, where you should be seen to be evaluated and or possibly tested in order to minimize risk to others and yourself. And they will be prepared and ready to mask and directly escort you into an isolation room upon your arrival rather than having you expose other people while trying to figure out what you're there for and where to direct you to. Calling ahead will also save you time spent waiting to be seen, especially if the medical facility is filled to over capacity with these illnesses. This can very well happen. There are only a few isolation rooms max per medical building. Did you guys know that? Regular exam rooms are not the same thing as an isolation room. If you are short of breath or have difficulty breathing though, by all means, do not hesitate to call 911. But if you decide to drive to the emergency room on your own, please call the ER to give them a heads up before you enter their building. Please seek more reputable sources for your information like the CDC, or the World Health Organization, I'll place link to those in the description down below, and follow their guidance. Note that the CDC does not recommend the use of masks or protective equipment if you're not sick. Prices of medical N95 masks and medical gowns have more than tripled, and there's a serious shortage that is leaving the medical community who is fighting in the trenches vulnerable and without the necessary tools to fight this thing. Now, if you are sick, then you should put that mask on to prevent its spread to others. Now, it doesn't have to be an N95 mask, different situation. But the store shortages and the fights over the hand sanitizers, bottled water, and toilet paper are seriously unnecessary and a little embarrassing, might I add. I mean, this shouldn't be happening in this country. We should be preparing for what we need, but not clearing out the shelves. For tips on how to prevent the spread of these nasty viruses, make sure to check out the second half of my prior video on the coronavirus saga. If you found this information valuable, which is always my goal, please subscribe, ring that bell so that you don't miss any of my videos, like, and then consider sharing it with someone else who may find this video useful. I will be keeping you updated on the latest medical topics and news as this virus hands out. As always, until next time, please stay safe.